Hello everyone, it's Melissa Parker, instructor at Gurnick Academy for the prereqs course. Today I'm going to be going over lecture 10. So there's a few terms that you're going to want to know um, by their definition. So the first one is going to be enzyme. Enzyme is a substance that's produced by the body to assist in a chemical reaction. So for example, we have like digestive enzymes. These are enzymes that help to break down and digest food. <clears throat> also, we have catalysts. So catalyst is an agent that speeds up a chemical reaction without participating in it, and it remains unchanged by the end of the reaction. So an example of a catalyst would be like adding sugar to yeast water. Um, an active site, this is the location where the reaction happens. And then enzyme, this is a binding site or the enzymes binding site. This is the location where the substrates will attach to the enzyme. And then substrates or the reactant which are helped by the enzyme. So substrates are substances on which an enzyme acts. Like for example, soil is the substrate for most seeds and plants. Okay, so enzymes, the natural catalyst. So substrates will fit into uh, the enzyme binding site pocket. So this right here is a representation of the substrate. This right here is the enzymes binding site right here. So this is where the substrate is gonna go into the enzyme. So the, in, the substrate is sitting in the enzymes binding site right here. This is the pocket. That's called the enzyme substrate complex. And the enzyme changes shape slightly called a conformational change. Um, and so when <clears throat> the substrate comes into the enzyme right here, it's actually leaving the site as a different product. Um, so each enzyme has a very specific three-dimensional shape, which specifically uh, has shaped pockets or binding sites. Like if you go back to this one right here and you look right here, these shapes are very specific to the substrate. So enzymes are a protein, right? And proteins jobs are determined by their shape or, and that determines its function. Um, so enzymes are specific to their substrates. So the enzymes only work what they're for their designed function. Um, and the reaction is then catalyzed. So enzymes are biological molecules that act as a catalyst and they help com complex reactions occur everywhere in life. So let's say you ate a piece of meat. So protease, so things that end in ACE are usually enzymes, um, will go to work to help break down the peptide bonds that are between the amino acids. So enzymes are specific to their substrates and the reactions catalyze. So usually one enzyme results in one reaction. And it is also important to note that many enzymes catalyze reactions going both ways. So we can take the substrates and turn them into products, um, or we can take the products and turn them into substrates. However, there are some enzymes that catalyze reactions only one way. So we have the substrates and they only produce a product, but they do not do the reverse. So enzymes that catalyze, catalyze reactions both ways. So an example of something that we learned is glycolysis. This is a one-way enzyme. So pyruvates can go to the acetyl groups, but not reverse, right? We can't take an acetyl and change it back into a pyruvate but we can take glucose and change it to a pyruvate and we could take pyruvates and change it back to a glucose. So those are examples of how one enzyme can go both ways versus another substrate can only go in one direction. 
So here's another example of an enzyme substrate. So these again are the substrates up here. These would represent the enzymes. So the enzymes are very specific to their shape, right? So this one can't fit here because it doesn't fit in that shape. Whereas this one can fit here and this one can fit here. Um, so enzymes um, kind of remind me of like an assembly line of robots. Excuse me. Okay, so you know about cars and they have assembly lines where they're made. And there are these giant robots that help people do specific tasks. So some of those robots will lift the whole car, some will lift just the doors and some will put bolts on the frame. So the enzymes work like these giant robots. They grab one or two pieces and they do something with them and then they release them. And once their job is done, they move on to the next piece or the next car and do the same thing. So these are just little protein robots that are inside of our body. So the robot was designed to move a car door. It can't put on the brakes to the car. And the specialized robot arms uh, just can't do the job. So the enzymes are the same. The they um, enzymes are the same. They can only work with one specific molecule and they can only do specific tasks because there are so many specific, they are so specific, their structure is very important. Um, if only one amino acid of the enzyme is messed up, then the enzyme might not work. And it would be as if someone had unplugged the cord to the robot. So the, the shape is very specific to its function. Okay, so before we go to page six, let's go ahead and do our practice question. So number one, the part of the enzyme where reactants attach is called, and that would be B, the binding site. Okay, which of the following is not true about enzymes? And the answer would be A, all enzymes catalyze reactions going one way. Three, enzymes usually catalyze a reaction only for specific substrates because of the specific shape or A binding site. So enzyme names, I kind of mentioned this just a minute ago, but um, enzyme names, so the following points are some guides for enzyme names. They end in ACE, and enzymes are named after their substrates or whatever product it is, um, and enzymes can be named after the reaction they catalyze. So for example, excuse me, lipase, right? So ends in ACE, I know it's an enzyme, but the lie is for the lipid or lip, right? Um, so that helps to break down fat protease. Protease helps to break down proteins. And amylase helps to break down starch. <clears throat> so coenzymes and cofactors. So enzymes need little helpers. Um, so coenzymes are made up of vitamins. And so examples of that would be like folate, vitamin B1, B2, B3, or ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, and then biotin. And then cofactors are typically made up of minerals. So these are things that you'll find on the periodic table, like copper, zinc, calcium, manganese, and magnesium. The human body recycles and reuses the coenzymes Sorry, coenzymes and cofactors over and over again. I'm so sorry. Okay, so practice questions one. Which of the following is a cofactor for an enzyme that copies DNA? Um, so remember cofactors, those are minerals. So it has to be B, zinc, because the rest of them are vitamins. And vitamins are um, coenzymes. Okay, what? which of the following is not true about coenzymes and factors? So the answer would be C, coenzymes and cofactors must be ingested in small amounts um, for enzymes to have enough. Um, so, or excuse me, they must be ingested in large amounts, not small amounts. Um, they actually need to be ingested in small amounts because remember coenzymes, we can recycle and we can re reuse our vitamins so we don't eat them in large quantities. So denaturation, this is an um, invisible change in the shape 
of a protein that leads to the loss of its physical and its chemical properties and a loss of the protein's function. Um, so we can use enzymes over and over again and we can recycle them unless they end up being denatured. Um, once they're denatured, you cannot reverse that process. So protein denaturation, um, which is an irreversible change in the 3D shape of the protein. So remember, we talked about how proteins are um, have a very specific shape and their shape determines their function. So if we change the shape of it, it's not going to perform the same type of function. So an example of that is the egg white Gosh, guys, sorry, the egg white protein albumin in its original state is a clear and colorless liquid, but when you cook it, it turns into white solid. Even if you cool it down afterwards, it does not return back to the original state. So the reason is because the change that happened during the heating process was irreversible and it was permanent. The albumin was denatured by the heat. So denaturation of proteins, including enzymes, because enzymes are proteins, can be due to extreme pH. So that can be either too acidic or it could even be too alkaline. Also high temperatures, so heating it up. Like example for the egg. High pressure, physical stress such as shaking. So like I used to have a patient where I had to um, go to her house every week and I had to administer an infusion to her. And the medication, I had to be very gentle when I was mixing the medication up. You couldn't shake it because if you did, it would change the shape and then it wouldn't work properly for the patient. Um, also, high concentrations of ions or salts. All right, so there's a practice question on the bottom of page eight. It says, the following can denature an enzyme except, and the answer, answer is low pressure. It's only high pressure. So factors that influence enzymatic activity. So concentration of substances. So the higher the concentration of the substrates, the faster the reaction uh, will, will move forward, right? So if you have your little um, enzyme, right? Um, let me draw a little enzyme right here, right? The more of these little substrates that I have out here, the more likely they're gonna bind at this particular site right here. So the concentration of coenzymes and cofactors. So um, I always tell my kids, many hands make light work, right? And if you remember, coenzymes and cofactors are helpers for the enzymes. So if you have a lot of help, then it's gonna to help to speed up the reaction and make it occur faster. Also temperature, the lower the temperature will result in molecules moving slower. Remember we learned about that when we talked about water um, and the reason why when it's cold, it turns into a solid is because the molecules are moving very slowly. Um, at high temperature, it will result in the molecules moving faster, thus a faster reaction. Um, so pH of a solution. So pH of a solution indicates how acidic or how alkaline it is. So the pH scale, the solution with high concentration of hydrogen protons is called um, an acid or acidic. A solution with a low concentration of hydrogen protons is called alkaline. So a neutral solution has excuse me, has hydrogen proton concentrations that are in the middle. So it will have a pH of seven. Oops, I thought I had my highlighter on. It'll have a pH of seven, which is neither acidic or neither alkaline. You don't have to memorize these numbers or what they are, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. So hydrochloric acid, that's the acid that's found inside of our stomach. It's a very strong acid. It has, it's a pH of 1.5. So the lower the number, the more acidic a, a substance is. Any number higher than seven, the more alkalinic it's gonna be, the further it moves away from seven. So acidic acid or vinegar, it has a pH of 5.3, so that's a weak acid. 
So sometimes people get this a little bit confused because you know this is 1.5 and this is 5.3 and 5.3 is a larger number. But the closer we get to seven, the less acid or less acidic the substance is. The only difference from that is when we're talking about an alkaline substance, okay? So sodium bicarbonate or baking soda has a pH of 8.2. So that's close to seven. That's a weak base. So it's kind of the opposite of what we were talking about with um, the acid, right? Um, and sodium hydroxide has a pH of 13.5. So it's a very strong base. And then water has a pH of seven. It's neutral. It's neither acidic and it's neither alkaline. So our normal body pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Um, so there are some questions on uh, page 10 at the very top where um, it's talking about um, the logs. We're not gonna be doing the logs, okay? Okay, so on page 11, the pH scale. Um, so a lot of people get very confused by the pH scale, okay? So remember, neutral is seven, okay? So, if it's less than seven, okay, then the more acidic, the closer, how do I explain this? So if if this is zero or one down here, the furthest, the further you move away from neutral, the more acidic it's going to be. And remember, a neutral is neither acidic nor alkaline, so like water. Whereas from the seven moving out or to a higher number, the stronger the alkaline will be. So the closer to the neutral, it'll be weak for the alkaline and it will become stronger. I don't know why it keeps doing that. It'll become stronger as we move away. Now it doesn't want to erase. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, so don't get that confused, okay? The more you move away from seven toward the one, the stronger the acid. From seven toward a higher number, whether it's 14, the more alkaline it's going to get. And remember our blood pH um, is usually between 7.35 to 7.45. So we're slightly alkaline in our body. Okay, so practice questions. Which of the following is not true about the pH scale? And the answer is that the solution that has a high concentration of hydrogen protons will have a, have a high pH number. Um, so, the more acidic something is, the lower the number is. So that's why that one's not true. And then even if you don't know the pH of hyaluronic acid, which of the following could it be? So we already know it's an acid, right? So it'd have to be lower than seven. So the answer is H. Okay, so now let's talk about enzyme inhibition. So there are three types of enzyme inhibition. There's feedback inhibition, there's competitive inhibition, and then there's non-competitive inhibition. So feedback inhibition or negative feedback, this is where an enzyme is inhibited by the accumulated product of the reaction that it, can, it catalyzes. So too much of the product, um, then the reaction will slow down. So a negative feedback is a natural process that prevents an overproduction of anything, like for example, insulin. Okay, if our blood sugar is high, we're gonna secrete insulin in enough quantity to move that sugar that's in our blood into the cell, but our body's not gonna continue to keep putting out 
insulin. Once we receive that blood or once that blood sugar reaches that normal level, the pancreas will stop secreting the insulin. That's an example of a negative feedback loop, feedback loop. Or the same thing we've talked about before is the thermostat in our home, right? If I'm hot and I want to cool the house down, I can set my thermostat at 75. So if my house is 85 currently, it's going to cool down until it gets to 75 and then it's going to shut off. It doesn't keep cooling the house down until it's like 45 degrees in the house. So that's an example of a negative feedback loop. Sorry, I'm just checking my notes, make sure um, I have everything. Okay, so now we're going to talk um, about uh, competitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition or inhibitor is a molecule that temporarily, so the key word here is it temporarily occupies the binding site of the enzyme. Therefore, it prevents the true substrate from binding to the enzyme undergoing the reaction. So um, if you look at page 13, they have like a little diagram. Um, so an example of that would be aspirin. Aspirin is a competitive inhibitor of an enzyme called cycloaminoxidase or COX, which converts acridonic acid into prostaglandins causing inflammation and pain. Thus, aspirin temporarily prevents the formation of prostaglandins, which prevents inflammation and pain. But it's only temporary. That's why when we take aspirin or Tylenol, it wears off, right? After four to six hours, we have to take another aspirin or another Tylenol <clears throat> to help with the pain because it's temporary and it's competing for that binding site. So non-competitive is different. So this is kind of similar to the picture that you have on page 13. So non-competitive has the substrate doesn't compete for this binding site right here, okay? It's not competing for this. There's something else that's going to bind to a different receptor site on the enzyme and it changes the shape so that the substrate will no longer fit in the actual binding site because the shape changed, okay? So remember when we change the shape of an enzyme, it's permanent, we can't take it back, okay? So this is a permanent change. This is an example of what I was talking about with the aspirin. It's competitive. So this, this right here um, would, rep, would represent the aspirin. So this would represent normally the, um, the cox that they were talking about over there. It normally comes to this binding site and it starts inflammation. But what happens is the aspirin binds here so that we can't cause the inflammation. And so therefore we can't have pain if we don't have the inflammation. But remember, this is temporary, right? And this one over here is permanent because we're changing the shape. And once you change the shape, it can't do its job anymore. So uh, the non-competitive inhibitor <clears throat> doesn't care about the binding sites. That, because the when we talk about the binding site, the aspirin and the substrate are competing for the binding site. But with a non-competitive, it doesn't care about that. The molecule is going to attach to the enzyme in a different place, and it's going to cause the enzyme to undergo a conformational change. So it's changing shape. Usually, this change is permanent, causing the enzyme to be deactivated permanently, becoming unavailable to catalyze a reaction. So an example of that would be carbon monoxide, which permanently occupies the hemoglobin molecule, making it permanently unavailable to carry uh, the, the oxygen or carbon uh, dioxide. Okay, so before we go to the central nervous system, you guys have practice questions on page 14. So number one, it says the inhibitor is the product of the reaction, and that would be C. 
a feedback inhibition. Two says the inhibitor is the substrate of the reaction, and that would be D, none of the above. Three would be um, the inhibitor temporarily occupies a binding site it, um, in the enzyme. That's going to be A, competitive inhibition. And then number four says the inhibitor permanently changes the enzyme shape, deactivating it indefinitely. And that would be B, non-competitive inhibition. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and go over the central nervous system. So the central nervous system, the brain can be divided into four major parts. There's the cerebrum, which is the higher brain. That's this up here. Then there's the diencephalon, uh, which is the interbrain. So that's in here. And then there's the brain stem, which is this right here. And then there's the cerebellum, which is right here. So the diencephalon, di means two. So that is the hypothalamus and the thalamus that make up the diencephalon. The brainstem is composed of three parts, the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. So the medulla oblongata contains nuclei, which is a mass of gray matter. So when it's gray, that tells me that it's not myelinated because myelinated nerves um, have an appearance of white because they have a fatty substance on it. So uh, which serves as a center for control for major vital functions. So the medulla oblongata is our vasomotor center. So that helps control our blood pressure and our heart rate. Respiratory control center, so how we breathe, our cough reflex center, our vomit reflex center, and also the origin of four out of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you the cranial nerves for this class, but you will need to memorize them for your anatomy class. So cranial nerves are nerves that come out of the brain and they exchange information from the brain to the body parts. So for example, like our eyes, um, we can see, smell our nose, right? And facial nerves, so smiling, um, tasting. So two, the pons, it controls some respiratory reflexes and facial nerves. So the origin of four cranial nerves, so five, six, seven, and eight, it's con it controls some auditory reflexes such as turning toward the sound or the source of a sound. And then the midbrain, the center of the eyes reflexes, origin for cranial nerves three and four, both control movements of the eye muscles. It conducts impulses between the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum and between the spinal cord and the diencephalon. And remember the diencephalon is your thalamus and your hypothalamus. Um, so here's another picture with your brain structures. So we have our cerebrum right here, and then our midbrain, our pons, and then the medulla oblongata, our diencephalon right here, and then our cerebrum, our cerebellum right here. And then down here is the spinal cord. So the diencephalon consists of two parts, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, so the hypothalamus is the center for homeostatic control. Um, so it's the center of communication between the CNS and the endocrine system. And it connects the pituitary gland, the master gland, which rules most other glands and tells them what to do. Um, the thalamus uh, it collects sensory impulses coming from the spinal cord and it directs them to the appropriate parts of the primary sensory area in the uh, cerebrum and then also in the higher brain. Um, so our hypothalamus, so I wanna go back really quick. Um, it controls specific functions like our body temperature. So it's our thermostat to our body. Also our hydration our electrolyte imbalance, our nutritional balance, our sleep and awake cycles, reproduction, and both our sympathetic and our parasympathetic divisions of our nervous system. 
Um, so again, um, this right here represents our cerebral hemisphere. This is our diencephalon right here. This is the midbrain. This is the pons. This is the medulla oblongata. This is our spinal cord. This is our cerebellum right here. So our brainstem is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, and the diencephalon is made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So our cerebellum, which means small brain or the hind brain, is located in the back of the head, and it's divided into two hemispheres. There's, so there's two halves, a right and a left, and it's separated by the vermis. Um, the function of the cerebellum all deal with coordination. So coordination of our smooth and smoothness of our skeletal muscle contractions. So like when I move my arm, it's not like a jerky motion, right? It's coordinated and it's very smooth and graceful. Awareness of body position. So knowing where my hand is in relation to the rest of my body. And then awareness of posture, whether, and that's usually unconscious. So anytime I move, I'm having to adjust my posture so that I'm balanced. Also maintaining balance. And this is all done unconsciously. We're not thinking about doing it. Our body just does it. So awareness of direction and movement of the body in space by getting impulses from the inner ear. Okay, so we have practice questions on page 18. Um, you may end up using one of these more than once. Number one, the center of the, of the control for heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate is B, the medulla oblongata. Two, the center of homeostatic control of most body functions, including body temperature, is E, hypothalamus. The center of body, the center of control of body's movement, posture, and coordination is D, the cerebellum. For the part of the brain that controls the cough reflex and vomit reflex is B, the medulla oblongata. And five, the part of the brain that belongs in the diencephalon is E, the hypothalamus. Okay, so the cerebrum, this is the largest part of the brain. It's the site of conscious thought and reasoning, and it's divided into two cerebral hemispheres, a right and a left, and it's divided by a longitudinal fissure. So this is that longitudinal fissure right here where the red is. The cerebral cortex, which is the outer layer of the cerebrum, is made of gray matter. So if it's gray, it's unmyelinated neurons. Um, the surface of the cerebral cortex contains giri, which are multiple folds. So the um, upside down U, that's a giri. And the sulcus is the indentation. So that's the correct shape U. So the indentation or the sulcus or sulci and the giri is the, um, the folds that you see. Um, in our central nervous system, we have something called the limbic system, which consists of three parts. There's the hippocampus, there's the amygdala, and there's the reticular activating system. And we're going to go over each one of them. And you need to know what each one of them does. Um, so here's our hippocampus right here. So he's responsible for learning. As you can see, he has his little backpack right here and also memorizing all that information. So hippocampus, right? Hippocampus for learning and memory, okay? Amy, so Amy here, she's a very emotional person. So I'm sorry if we have any Amys in the class. This isn't picking on you. This is just an analogy I use, okay? So Amy is very emotional. Um, and fearful. So, and these are like res responses to emotions. So emotional responses, which can include fear. So Amy is emotional. So Amy or amygdala is responsible for our emotions. Then RAS, so we usually abbreviate this as RAS or the reticular activating system. This is responsible for our wakefulness, our alertness and our ability to stay focused. So your reticular activating system may not be listening very well right now because you're probably bored of hearing my voice, right? Okay, so practice question um, on page 20. 
Uh, so it says to match the following structures of the cerebral cortex and precortex with their functions. So one, the largest part of the brain in human, excuse me, responsible for conscious thought, decision-making and information processing is gonna be E, the cerebrum. Two, the part of the limbic system responsible for learning and memory formation is B, the hippocampus. Three, part of the limbic system responsible for wakefulness and alertness is C, RAS, or the reticular activating system. For the outer part of the brain that consists of the gray unmyelinated neurons is D, the cerebral cortex, and then part of the limbic system responsible for emotions is Amy or amygdala. So the right and the left cerebral hemisphere are separated um, from each other by the, and then it's C, longitudinal fissure. Um, so the cerebral cortex is composed of four lobes. You have your frontal lobe, which is right here, the parietal lobe, which is kind of uh, in the middle, and then the occipital lobe, which is in the back, the temporal lobes. So you think of your temple or temporal, it's on the side. And then um, the occipital lobe, which is back here. Um, we're gonna learn that that means occipital, means the eyes and back of your head. That's how I remember it. Okay, so the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Um, there's a central sulcus that kind of runs in here. I think I have a picture of it later. The corpus callosum is a special structure at the bottom of the longitudinal fissure, and it facilitates communication between the right and the left hemisphere. So this little yellow structure you see right here is the corpus callosum. Um, so the frontal lobe is the primary motor area. So note the right side of the brain is gonna control the left side of the body and the left side of the brain is gonna control the right side of the body. Um, and the Broca area, which is on the left, is our oral motor speech. And then our written speech area is on the left. And then reasoning, problem solving, and cognitive responses. Um, our parietal lobe, this is our primary sensory area. So again, the right parietal lobe is responsible for sensory perceptions. Excuse me, from the left side of the body and vice versa. Uh, the temporal lobe, um, so we have our auditory. So auditory has to do with hearing. So auditory receiving area, so perceiving the sound. Auditory association area, which is recognizing and interpreting what that sound is. The Wernick area, which is on the left, that's for our native speech. Um, and then comprehension, which is on the right, like foreign language. And olfactory, so that has to do with our nose and smell. So that's the center of recognizing and interpreting smells. And it's highly connected to the limbic system, excuse me. Occipital, ox, occipital, occipital lobe, um, so visual receiving area or perceiving images by receiving sensory impulses from the eye retina. And then visual association area, which is recognizing and interpreting images. Um, so the term occipital, um, is the eyes and back of your head, which, which helps me to remember that it's in the back over here. Okay, so let's go over our practice questions on 22. So A says frontal lobe, that's A located behind the forehead bone right here. The parietal lobe that is located on the top of the head up here. The temporal lobe is located on the sides of the area of the head right here and the occipital is located in the back area of your head. So that's B, located in the back of the head. All right, so let's learn a little bit about the neurotransmitters. So ne neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are chemicals on how our body communicates with each other. So acetylcholine is used in somatic neurons. And remember, somatic neurons are the ones that we consciously control, like our skeletal muscles. So we learned that last lecture. And it's also used in the parasympathetic neurons for communication with the visceral organs. So telling you know, our stomach to digest our food and so forth. Epinephrine and adrenaline is used by sympathetic neurons for communication with visceral organs. And then dopamine um, produces a sense of pleasure and reward. 
serotonin, it helps produce a sense of calm, peace, and happiness. GABA suppresses activities of neurons and slows down the action potential and it suppresses CNS activity. So you probably heard of a drug called gabapentin. So gabapentin usually um, helps with pain, like neuro, uh, neuropathy pain. So um, it slows down the message that's being sent to the brain that says we're having pain here, and that's how it decreases the pain. So endorphins, they slow down brain activity and they reduce the perception of pain. Um, we talked last week about how taking like a hot bath can help to increase endorphins. Um, adrenaline, this stimulates brain activity and it focuses the brain and it produces a sense of an alertness. So you need to know um, what all of these little neurotransmitters do. So 23, um, one says adrenaline. So adrenaline B focuses the brain. Dopamine is D, produces a sense of pleasure and joy and reward. M3 is serotonin. It produces a sense of calm, peace, and contentment. GABA, it slows down brain neuron activity, causes sedation. And then uh, endorphin, it blocks the perception of pain. All right, so now we're going to do um, the review questions. So which of the following is true? Select all that apply. So the solution with a high concentration of hydrogen protons will have a high pH number. That's false because uh, if it has a high concentration of hydrogen protons, it'll be acidic. So it should have a low pH number. A solution with a low concentration of hydrogen protons is considered alkaline. That is true. Any pH number that is below 7 is considered acidic. That's true. And the pH of 14 indicates a very strong alkal um, al alkali is the same thing as saying alkaline. Um, so remember, the closer you move to 7, the weaker the alkaline is. Okay, which of the following is not true about the limbic system? The answer would be C, RAS. It's responsible for emotions and our emotional responses. Which one of the following is not true about coenzymes and cofactors? Remember, coenzymes are vitamins and cofactors are minerals. Um, so folate works as a coenzyme. Copper works as cofactor. Coenzymes are recycled and reused. Um, cofactors are used once per reaction. So the answer is going to be cofactors are used once per reaction. They're used over and over again. So which of the following is responsible for the control of coordination of body movement, posture, and balance? The answer is going to be the cerebellum. So the uh, cerebrum, this is our conscious thought and our information processing. Um, the medulla oblongata controls like our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respirations. Uh, the brain stem, that's our pons, medulla, and the um, midbrain. Uh, Hypothalamus helps control our body temperature and it connects the pituitary gland. And then F is our thalamus or our sensory area. Okay, so match the following enzymes um, in order. So, oops. All right, so um, this is D, the substrate attaches to the binding site. The active site is the place where the reaction happens. The binding site is where the reactant attaches, and the enzyme is what catalyzes a specific um, biochemical reaction. Okay, so for each of the, these forms of enzyme inhibitions, find the appropriate choice. So um, number one is B. Um, inhibitor uh, temporarily occupies the binding site of the enzyme. So non-competitive inhibition is going to be D, the inhibitor changes shape of the 3D enzyme. And feedback inhibition, the inhibitor is a product of the enzyme reaction. Um, so just make sure you know what coenzymes cofactors are, uh, what enzyme inhibitions are, enzyme bindings, what happens with that. 
denaturation, pH scale, parts of the limbic system, neurotransmitters, the major brain functions of the anatomy, parts of the brain stem, et cetera, and the parts of the cerebral lobes. All right, so we're not gonna do the BMI work um, or the math. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a practice sheet to get ready to take your uh, midterm. Um, so you can skip the math portion if it's on BMI. If it's not on BMI, then go ahead and work out your math. But if it's BMI, I don't want you doing the BMI. Most facilities, you just plug in the height and the weight and it calculates the BMI for you. All right, so I'm gonna get ready to do a math review and I should post that uh, later for you as well. Thank you guys and have a great day. Thank you.